to see you this morning. We are launching a brand new series that I'm calling Habits of Growth, Understanding and Practicing the Spiritual Disciplines. Today, we're going to look at the goal. What is the goal in our journey of following Christ? The goal is godliness. You might see on the sidewall as well as hold in your hand just one of eight pieces of the program that we will roll out over the next eight weeks as we go through this series. Last week you heard me talk about the value of the arts in the church, and so this is just one iteration of that. Uh, you might want to keep that, uh, that bulletin that you have today because it will be expanding and uh, will become a piece of art, a work of art, uh, when we're through by the time that we've ended our, uh, our series. We're talking about growth today. Our physical world is filled with examples of growth. In fact, it's so prevalent in our world that when we see that which is to grow and it does not grow, it becomes alarming. I've been teasing my wife for about 20 plus years that she practices botany homicide in our home. <laughs> Plant is not safe under our roof. She tries, God bless her, she tries. Uh, usually a plant will show up, it'll be placed somewhere, uh, it will have a rich, full life for a day or two, <laughs> and then the journey will start to end, and uh, pretty soon I'll walk into the kitchen, and there it will be, by the sink, next to the window, and uh, it'll be uh, a shadow of the plant that it used to be, mostly brown at this point, and I'll let it sit there, and I'll say, you know, after about a week, you know that's dead, don't you? <laughs> and she believes in the power of the resurrection. <laughs> so she waters that thing and puts it in the sun, but it continues to deteriorate. And a couple days later, I'll say, you know that's dead. And she'll somewhat ignore me, rolling her eyes. Finally, week two, maybe week three, I'll say, you know that thing's dead. And she'll be like, all right, just throw it away. <laughs> And why, why? Well, because we're expecting it to grow, right? We're expecting it to have life. And when it doesn't have life, when it's, it's supposed to have life and it doesn't have life, well, that becomes alarming to us. Do you react in similar ways, that sense of alarm, in the spiritual dimension of your life? Is there that shock when you know the life that Christ has given you is supposed to be growing and flourishing tends to look like it's that shriveled up type of plant that's on its way to death? Scripture actually challenges us that we ought to be people who are perpetually moving, growing in Christ's likeness. I want to take you just kind of as a broad overview, more to set our theological stage, what Scripture has to say just about the subject of growth. So take your Bibles. We're going to start in the book of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. I want you to turn to chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount. We're only going to look at one verse out of the Beatitudes, and then we're going to move through the New Testament from the Gospels into Paul's epistles, into Ephesians, then Colossians, and 2 Timothy, and then end in 2 Peter. But we start here, the words of Christ. And I want you to sense, this is what I want to draw out of this particular moment for you, to sense that which Jesus is asking of us. He said, blessed verse 5, are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, verse 7, blessed are the merciful, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, there's a blessing to those who have hunger and desire after that which they are not yet. Specifically, as we look just at verse 6, blessed are those of us who are hungry and thirsty 
For what? For righteousness. The implication is that we ought to be people who are in a constant mode of hunger and thirst of growth in righteousness. Let's leave the Gospels, come over with me all the way to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. So you're going to go past Acts and Romans and First and Second Corinthians and Galatians. You're going to hit Ephesians chapter 4. Paul's now teaching this young fledgling church, and notice what he says in verse 11 of chapter 4. He, that's Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, here's the purpose, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children. Do you see the parallel? Full maturity to that of children, tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You're a part of the body. You're a part of the body is to grow. When you don't grow, part of the body does not grow. Again, we see that in the natural world, the physical world. What do we do? We're alarmed by that. We rush off to the specialist. We discover what is the problem. What is not normal? We should be asking something similar in the spiritual dimension. Come with me over to Colossians. Come past Philippians to Colossians chapter 1. Here I'm in verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you. By the way, as you're watching this, notice the prayer life of the Apostle Paul. It teaches us what to pray for. So we've not, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. What is Paul praying? That they would grow. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Turn there. 2 Timothy 2, 15. I'm always convicted by this passage because I wonder if I'm doing my best. That's what Paul calls for. Young Timothy, who will then transfer this message from his own soul into the heart of the congregation. He says, do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. One more, Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. Then I want you just to stay in 2 Peter because we're going to come to another passage in a moment. 2 Peter chapter 3, very last verse. I don't think it can be said any clearer. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What do you get as the overarching theme of just these five verses? that there is an expectation, there's a command that we ought to be maturing, growing in our spiritual lives. Now, it begs the question, how? All right, if this is the expectations from God's word, how might I do that? How should I grow? What is the process? What's the method? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be discovering over the next eight weeks or so. I'm going to take you on a journey 
of discovering what is called the spiritual disciplines. Now, for some of you, you're very familiar with that term. Others, it's brand new to you. So when you hear the word discipline, I don't want you to think punishment. I want you to think exercise. The spiritual exercise. Let me just give you a working definition so that we're all on the same page. The spiritual disciplines are exercises that promote spiritual growth. Write that down. The spiritual disciplines are exercises that promote spiritual growth. Now, over the next eight weeks, we're going to learn a number of them. Next week, we're going to look at the spiritual discipline of worship. Many of you have been asking me, what are we doing in our worship? Where are we going? I'm going to give you specifically where we're going. But underneath that is a desire of our pastoral staff, of our worship staff, to create a discipline in you to enjoy and to appreciate all the breadth of worship, the styles and the beauty of it. To not be locked into a preference that might become an idol, but rather to be open to all genres and then use it, learn how to use it for the edification of not only your own life, but for the life of the church. Following that, we're going to look at the scriptures. We're going to look at a spiritual discipline of simple Bible reading, which I think is untapped in many of our lives. Just simply reading the scriptures is a spiritual discipline. Followed on that, we're going to learn how to study, how to go to the next level. Then we're going to look at things like fasting. Maybe that's something brand new to you. You've never done that in a spiritual way. We're going to look at fasting. We're going to practice fasting. I'm going to call you to a fast. We're going to look at serving, how God has uniquely gifted you with an ability that is used for the edification of those seated around you and of the general body of the church. When you think of spiritual gifts as those impacting the people who sit to the right and left, front and back of you, suddenly it becomes very personal. And that's what a spiritual gift is. A spiritual gift is personal. It's personal to you. And then practice as a spiritual discipline, it becomes personal to others around you. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about lifelong learning as a worldview, as a Christ follower. And then that of perseverance, the call to persevere. You ever think about this? Why do we exercise? I mean, why, why are we into things like cycling and cardio and weights? Why do we do that? Well, ultimately, I think if you pull up any athlete, any wannabe athlete, anybody who's just trying to stay in shape, there's some goal attached to it. Maybe it's the goal to get into shape. I have a friend who's rather round. He says, round's a shape. I'm okay with that. <laughs> maybe it's a race or maybe it's a, to lose weight. There's always a goal attached to it. Well, it's the same concept here in our spiritual life. We're going to have a goal. And what's the goal? The goal is godliness. But now I've got to be careful here. There's a critical point. Spiritual disciplines are exercises, remember, that promote spiritual growth. They will not cause growth. They will not in and of themselves cause godliness. They will lead to growth. They will lead to godliness. But they in and of themselves will not produce a godliness in you. They're exercises. They're things that we use. I'll give you a great example of this. You're practicing a spiritual discipline right now. You might not realize that. The fact that you're here today, you're practicing coming to church. The scriptures tell us in Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the gathering together. You did not forsake that. You got out of bed this morning. You put it kind of on your calendar of things to do. I'm going to go. I'm going to be a part of the gathered church. That's a spiritual discipline. It's a spiritual exercise. But tell me this. Can someone attend a church and attend it for a long period of time? And never from the day they walked in to the day present 
look any more or grow any more like Jesus Christ and yet be a faithful church attender? Absolutely. We see it all the time. It becomes legalism. It becomes a box they check off. I've done that. We understand that really the gathered church gathered together why the writer of Hebrews told us not to forsake coming together was not so that we could check off a box, religiosity, something we've done, but rather we would use that for the edification of our own soul as well as the edification of those around us that we might mature and be Christ-like. That's why the church gathers together. It's not to check off a box. All the spiritual disciplines can dangerously move into an area of legalism if we don't temper it carefully and watch it carefully. We're going to be learning to exercise, to promote spiritual growth in a careful way so that it moves us towards godliness, doesn't simply act religious. Today what we're going to do is I want to help you understand just the dynamics of the disciplines. Next week, we're going to learn, dive in deep into the individual practices. So today, let me just help you understand three distinctives of the disciplines. Three distinctives. First distinctive is that, and it's somewhat we've already covered, but let's take it to the next level. It's expected of us. Practicing the disciplines that lend themselves to spiritual growth, there is an expectation. Let me show this to you first out of 2 Peter chapter 1. You're very close to it. You probably just need to turn a page or two to the left and you'll be there. I want you to see verses 5 through 8, but I'm going to ramp up to it by beginning in verse 3 so that we have a context. 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to begin in verse 3. Peter writes, his divine power has granted to us, watch this, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Do you see what he says in that very first verse? You have all that you need for spiritual growth. If the spirit is indwelling in you, you have all that you need. You learn to harness that. Verse 4, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them we may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. He says, what Christ has given you is salvation. And in that salvation, he has implanted in you his Holy Spirit. Because of that, you have all that you need to move forward in spiritual growth. Verse 5, for this very reason. What reason, Peter? Because you are the redeemed. For this reason, make every effort to supplement. Would you circle that word? We're going to come back to it. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go back, let's look at that word supplement. Interesting word in the original language, it means to add, that's all it means just simply means to provide something in addition to what already exists. You have a faith that has been given to you by Christ, add to it. Add to it in the form of growth. Add to it in the form of maturity. Add to it into the, into the form of sanctification. He's not talking about redemptive sense of justification, that's his work. He says, join in now with me and become sanctified, grow in Christ's likeness. But here's the interesting thing. Notice the path builds on itself. He says, these are the things I want you to work on. And I don't think this is a exhaustive list. He just gives us a few. Virtue, knowledge, self-control. Are you working on self-control? Isn't that something that is a sanctifying work? I'm working on self-control. I, I, I can be... Seems like I'm fine. I'm growing in a particular area. 
like driving. I'm growing in a particular area of self-control. Sometimes I'm not as good at self-control, usually because of others around me, but I'm fine. <laughs> you multiply that out in your life. Godliness, affection, love. Did you notice verse 8? For if these qualities are yours and are increasing. You know that word increasing, plenazo in the Greek. Very interesting word. Now we have things, lexicons, dictionaries, things that help us as English speakers understand what the original language. Let me, let me just pull out for you one paragraph that defines this word. Listen to this. This is the word increasing defined. It means, quote, to have or cause to have much or more than enough, except in 2 Peter 1.8. In 2 Peter 1.8, the word occurs only in the Pauline epistles where it means to covet or to desire more. In a, man, in a number of languages, it goes on to say, the equivalent of this expression might be if you have a great many of these or if these are big with you. I love that. If these are big with you, if these are increasing with you, you're being effective, you're being fruitful. You see, what he's saying is if these are not increasing, you're ineffective, you're unfruitful. That's the last thing that we want out of our Christian life, isn't it? I mean, we don't want to travel through our Christian life just to come to the end and to discover that we were not effective for the kingdom or that we were unfruitful. I mean, we must have a, an ability to measure what we are increasing in, what we are becoming fruitful in. And he gives these things, virtue, knowledge, self-control, godliness, steadfastness, affection, love. You see, there's ways to measure our spiritual growth. The spiritual disciplines help us do that. Like, when was the last time you took a serious look at your spiritual life and you determined there were certain areas that you need to work on? You need to move that sense of sin in that area down because you tend to, to fall to it so often. I mean, there are many. For any number of you, for all of us, None of us have arrived. Do you understand that? Don't ever put someone on a pedestal as if they're spiritual giants. I guarantee you, you are stronger in some areas than they are. They're stronger in some areas than you are. That's the body working together, helping to understand that, to learn, to grow together. Come with me over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy. Let me give you another passage that speaks of expectation in the disciplines. 1 Timothy 4, 7. Paul says, have, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. What a timely word. Have, I don't have anything to do with things that appear spiritual. It's irreverent. Those are silly myths. Rather, notice this, Train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, I'm so glad he put that in there. I have a treadmill in the basement that has become a closet. My clothes just hang on it. That's all it is. Don't laugh at me. You have treadmills in your basements. <laughs> bodily training is of value, some value. But be careful here that your bodily training doesn't become more important than what? Your spiritual training, that's his point. Godliness is of value in every way. It holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now the one thing I do admire about exercise and bodily training is that you can find others who are better at that than you are and they can become your coach. They can become your trainer. They'll teach you techniques. They'll hold you accountable. That's what's called a training regiment. This is the same idea that Paul is saying to Timothy. You must train yourself. This word train 
actually is the Greek word which we get gymnasium or gymnastic. It's the idea of disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness. Spiritual growth is expected from Scripture. Spiritual growth is expected from Jesus. Do you remember when he said, take my yoke upon, take my yoke upon you and learn from me? Do you know what a yoke is? A yoke is a type of tool that holds two oxen together so that they might do twice the work. Jesus is giving an invitation to us. Yoke yourself with me, and I will teach you. I will train you. There's an expectation. The second distinctive of, of uh, disciplines, of the spiritual disciplines, is that the disciplines place us in the path of God. They place us in the path of God. There are two stories in the book of Luke, you don't necessarily have to turn there, that I think illustrates this. It's found at the end of chapter 18 and the beginning of chapter 19, and I would imagine that these are two stories you've probably heard before. Jesus is on his way to Jericho, and there's a blind man sitting in the pathway. He hears of the ruckus that is going around him, and because he's blind, he's not quite sure what's happening. He reaches out to someone, what's going on? And someone says, well, Jesus is coming. He says, Jesus? You mean Jesus, the one that I've been hearing that heals people? As soon as he hears this, he begins shouting at the top of his lungs, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He wants to be healed. Well, he's shouting so loud that he's starting to embarrass those people who are around him, and they're trying to shoo him away. But he just shouts all the louder. In fact, the text says he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped, and what happens? He heals him. He put himself in the path of God. In the very next chapter, I think it's the continuation of the scene, now Jesus is entering Jericho, and there's a certain man that's desperate to see him. He sees the throngs of people waiting. He hears it's Jesus. He himself wants to meet him. His name is Zacchaeus. Now, do you know the story of Zacchaeus? Do you know the song of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up sycamore and... Very good. You know, that always shocks me when we do that kind of stuff because we come from all different diverse backgrounds and we're able in a moment to pick up a song we've heard years and years ago. Isn't that crazy? That's why the world thinks we're nuts. <laughs> but the story is true. I mean, here's Zacchaeus. He's a wee little man. He's actually a tax collector. He's the chief tax collector. He's a Jew and he's collecting taxes from other Jewish brethren to give to Rome, so he's not well-liked. In fact, he can't even go to the temple. He has a stature problem. He's a little short, so he has to climb up into a tree to see Jesus. The tree, we're assuming, hangs over where Jesus is going. Jesus walks right under him, looks up, looks at Zacchaeus. What did Zacchaeus do? Put himself in the pathway of God. Do you realize that's what we do when we practice the spiritual disciplines? We're putting ourselves in the pathway of God. Charles Spurgeon, that great 19th century preacher, said this, I must take care above all that I cultivate communion with Christ. For though that can never be the basis of my peace, mark that, yet it will be the channel of it. I'm convinced that as you practice and learn the spiritual disciplines, they become like channels. We put ourselves in the pathway of God. We meet him on a whole new level. The last distinctive is that the, 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 the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines are means to freedom. They're means to freedom. When my girls were little, they had two little instruments, a violin and a viola. 
And when they first started playing those little instruments, they would go upstairs in their room and put their music on a stand and pull that little instrument out. And they'd start to draw that bow across the string. And it sounded like a cat was vomiting. <laughs> I mean, it had the most ear piercing. Some of you are wondering, what's a What's the cat sound like when it vomits? You know, it, it says it's piercing. It drives you out of the house. But then now as young women, they can come home from college and they can open a case of their larger violin, larger viola, put bow to string and make beautiful music. They don't need the sheet music. It echoes through our house. I remember when they were little girls, you know, it was drudgery. Girls, practice, practice, 15 minutes, that's it, just 15 minutes, but practice. But as they grew in their proficiency of that instrument, the instrument started to come alive until now, it's almost second nature, it's it's freedom they pick up and play. That's exactly what you're going to experience with the spiritual disciplines. Richard Foster in his classic book, The Celebration of the Disciplines, says that the spiritual disciplines are a door to liberation. Elton Trueblood in his book, The Company of the Committed, writes, we have not advanced very far in our spiritual lives if we have not encountered the basic paradox of freedom, that we are the most free when we are bound. Elizabeth Elliot says something similar. She says, quote, freedom and discipline have come to be regarded as mutually exclusive when in fact freedom is not at all the opposite but the final reward of discipline. That's the common thread that these authors are encouraging us to consider. That the commitment to the reward of godliness must be pursued. There are times when I open my Bible early in the morning just to simply read. And what I really want to do is just sit there quietly or turn on Sports Center or just kind of zone off back to sleep. It's the drudgery of the discipline, and at times you'll feel that way, but in your perseverance will open the floodgates to freedom and an intimacy with Christ. I want to close by giving you a graphic reminder of a danger that we face. Would you turn, last passage, Revelation chapter 2. Last book of the New Testament, second chapter, verse 1. John is writing, and he's writing of a vision that he is receiving from Jesus. And what we have in chapter 2 are the words of Jesus. They're the words to a church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. He says this to them. I know your works and your toil and your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary. Stop there. Joe Stoll was president of the Moody Bible Institute. And one, while going through the book of Revelation, I remember him saying, after reading the accolades about the church at Ephesus, that he was tempted to nominate them church of the year. But he didn't because he knew Jesus would veto that nomination. Verse four, Jesus says to them, but I have this against you. That's chilling. How can he have anything against them? I mean, look at this. He says, I know your works. He's talking about fruitful labor. He's talking about 
them actually carrying on the kingdom of Christ. He says, I see it as a toil, kapiato, so the idea of working to the point of sweat and exhaustion. These people worked hard. They had patient endurance. That idea is, is the stick to They had perseverance. They had purity. They did not tolerate wickedness. They had doctrinal authenticity. They would test their teachers, their apostles, and if they found them to be false, eradicate them out of the church. They endured hardship. This has the idea of suffering for the name of Christ. But I have this against you. What? That you have abandoned the love you had at first. John Stott said in his commentary, their first flush of ecstasy had passed. Their early devotion to Christ had cooled. They had been in love with him, but they had fallen out of love. That's exactly what Jesus says. Remember, therefore, verse 5, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. He says, come back to me. Remember. Remember when your faith was fresh and new. Remember. Do you remember that? Do you remember that, that first time opening the Scriptures and reading those things that would mystify you and draw you close. Your heart was alive because the word's alive and it was meeting you in a spiritual dimension you never experienced before. Or the first time you got quiet in a room and maybe fell down into your knees and here you are all alone but you're talking and it feels like there's someone listening. Do you remember that? Has that diminished for you? Has that faded? Jesus calls us back to our, our first love. He says, repent. Do the things you did at first. Do those spiritual disciplines that drew you close to me. That's the path I'm encouraging you to walk on. Walk with us as we teach you the spiritual disciplines, as we practice it as a body of believers as we encourage not only that we do it in a sense corporately, but we also do it privately. That we walk the journey of learning and then infusing that into our lifestyle. Join us in the path of the spiritual disciplines and learn that you walk through the door of liberation and freedom that leads to godliness and intimacy with Christ. Would you stand with me? If we're going to embark on such a journey, then we need the Spirit's help, wouldn't you say? Yes. We cannot do it alone. This is not something we can manufacture. This is something we must be dependent upon as he guides us and as we build new disciplines in our lives so that we might seek after and grow more and more like our Savior. Let's pray to that end. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the work already accomplished by Jesus Christ. A work of salvation, yes, a work of sanctification. We know we cannot grow without the Spirit. May we be sensitive to the Spirit's work in our lives. May we be sensitive to new things that maybe we've never tried before. May we learn what it means to supplement, to increase, to train for the purpose of godliness. What we invite you to do is exactly what David invited you to do. Search us, O oh God. See if there's any wicked way in us. Eradicate that from our lives. Create in us a clean spirit. May we understand what it means to walk in step, to grow in godliness. And then the sweetness of intimacy with you. We wait, we long. We anticipate what you will do in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. This has been a message from The Chapel in Akron, Ohio. For more information about The Chapel or to listen to more of these types of life applicable messages, please go to our website at thechapel.life.